Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us on this skill acquisition webinar. Uh, this is a series of webinars that we're putting together as a technical department from Massachusetts Youth Soccer. We've got Tommy Guys coming up tomorrow at three o'clock. I will remind you about that at the end of this presentation. My presentation today is going to be, as I said, on skill acquisition and how it comes into effect in a play practice play session. I'm going to try to make this as interactive as any of these online formats can be, but we'll see how that works. If you look up in the right hand corner, you should have the availability of a chat function. And if you would like to type in any questions that you have into that chat box, we'll for sure stop the presentation and try to give an answer as concisely as possible to the question that you've asked. And maybe we'll figure out even how to unmute your microphone so we can have a bit more of a conversation, especially being that this webinar series is called Coaching Conversations. So without further ado, we will kick off into the presentation. So a quick thumbs up, if you can see the screen. Magical. Okay, so the, uh, we've I've titled this one Skill Acquisition in a Play Practice Play Training Session. And the reason for that being is, you know, one of my roles for Massachusetts Youth Soccer and, and even for U.S. Soccer at times is uh, as a coach educator. And within that role, the number one question that comes up without a doubt is where has the technique gone? And that would be my little blurb in the right hand corner here. Technique, what's that? Because it appears that technique seems to have disappeared out of all the coaching education courses. Well, hold on a minute, because guess what? We're trying to bring technique back, only we're launching it under a different guise, and that guise is skill acquisition. And I'll get into a little bit deeper of what skill acquisition means in a play practice play training session as we go through the presentation here. And I'm going to try to do this in the only way that I can do really, which is the layman's way. I'm going to try and dodge out of some of the scientific terminology, but I'm sure I'll bring some in at some point because it just seems to be the de facto way of doing things. All right, so question number one for you all is what skills do children need to acquire to play soccer effectively? So this is your first opportunity to write into the uh, chat box your responses as to what skills you believe children need to play soccer effectively. I'll give you 30 seconds and your time starts now. For those of you that are looking for the chat function, it should be up in the top right hand corner. If you sc scroll your mouse to the top of the screen, you should find it there. Rob, are we getting any responses? We are getting lots of responses. Uh, Tom Scott, ball mastery control, Luminion, reading, making decisions, executing. Tammy's got passing, Heidi, passing, receiving. Uh, they're all coming in. Can you see them? I cannot see them. I do not have the ability to have that function, unfortunately, as I'm sharing my screen. Uh, and so for everybody listening at home, I'm assuming that's where you are, except for you, Garrow, of course, who's in your car in a parking lot because you're trying to avoid the children for the morning. Um, Rob Holiday, our marketing director, marketing guru, marketing genius, call him what you will, is assisting me today and he's going to monitor the chat room and he'll be the guy that switches your microphone on and off as and when we have the capability of creating a one-on-one -on -one conversation. All right, so first and foremost, how many skills are there? There are six skills that a soccer player needs to play soccer effectively. What are each of those skills? 
You can now check your answers because I can't see them. So the first one is shoot. And what you may find here is a concurrence with the grassroots roadmaps and the player actions. The second one would be dribble, essentially to move the ball forward or to take on an opponent or just to keep the ball. The next one would be to pass. That would be on the ground, in the air, bending the ball, putting the ball over people, crossing the ball into a central area to create a scoring opportunity, but passing and all its variations. Then we've got receiving, similar type thing here with receiving, receiving out of the air, receiving on the ground, receiving with different body surfaces, receiving the ball by hitting or locating different surfaces to receive the ball with, and then preparing the ball to move on for the next action. Then we've come to a defending piece. I've termed it steal the ball to be aligned with the grassroots roadmap player actions for defending of steal the ball. That is the act of tackling. So how do you go about that? What's your angle, speed, distance of approach? and what's the footwork required and how do you actually win the ball back by using various types of tackling either the poke or the block is what we could potentially and probably will focus on today and then the final one i've left it out to the last is heading so hopefully you've managed to get your list now in line and you've got all six things that we used to call technique that we're now terming as part of our skill acquisition process so those are the six skills heading being the last one because of course we have this fabulous new law that children under the age of 13 should not be doing a great deal of heading and that is the only reason that it is listed last so the next question for you Thinking about children who play in the four versus four age group. So we're dealing with six, six year olds and eight year olds. What player actions are needed for this age group? Your time starts now. What player actions, or if you like skills, if you prefer techniques, into the chat box you go. Let's see what you can come up with compared to what I have. Uh, I, I might give you 30. Yeah, go ahead. Doing their task. Uh, lots of mentions in the chat box in response to your previous one in regards to um, soccer skills that aren't necessarily technique. So reading the game, life skills, and so on. So if you could provide a differentiation between why you've determined these techniques as skills, uh, that would be great. Uh, absolutely. So what I've, all I've done is I've listed the actual physical mechanical actions that a person are required to do to manipulate and move a soccer ball up and down the field into the goal. And what I what, what I haven't included or what isn't clear from this particular slide is what we're going to get into a bit a little bit later, and this is what determines the difference between skill acquisition and technique taught in isolation, is the pre-action, the in-action, and the post-action required, which now includes mental agility, uh, physical movement, body shape, how you prepare your body, how you prepare your, how you prepare the ball, uh, and then mentally what you're thinking about before the ball arrives, what are you trying to do with it as it arrives at your feet or as it arrives at your body, and what's the next objective as you deliver the ball on or move the ball forward through the various techniques that we've listed. So it's a good observation, and it's one of the reasons that I've tried to put this in a, as simple a language as possible, um, without knocking any of the other skills skill acquisition pieces that I've seen have been a little bit heady in terms of where they've come from and I'm trying to get this down to a level that hopefully everybody can understand and I'm going to try not to use the word hopefully too often. Long answer, sorry about that. If that satisfies people you can give us a thumbs up or you can hit the star for the highlight of the video.
All right, so what player actions are needed for this age group in the four versus four? Well, first and foremost, we have to understand exactly what we're trying to do with them based on their needs. And as we should all be aware, and maybe we're not, and if you're not, you're about to be. The two basic needs of players, which, by the way, is growing exponentially day by day, the two basic needs of players are to have fun and to develop. So they want to have fun because fun will lead to enjoyment, enjoyment will lead to passion, passion will lead to love, and now we've got them hooked and we can keep them in the game longer. So fun to joy, joy to passion, passion to love, and let's see if we can create those kind of environments first and foremost. But let's understand what these players' needs, needs are, which is to develop. So having fun while developing or developing while having fun should go hand in hand. And the de player development framework says the ball is playing with me and I am playing with the ball. So the player actions required for attack would look like this. They need to be able to shoot from distance, close range, and when somebody is trying to contest them for the ball or when they become that player who can outrun everybody and they have a free shot on goal. And for all of those that have ever seen six-year-olds play, how many times have you seen a breakaway player get right up by the goal and still miss even from a yard out? Well, there may be a reason why that's happening. And that's our job as coaches to try to help change that behavior. And then, of course, dribbling. We think, again, thinking about six-year-old players, the only toy on the field is the ball. And what we want them to do is have possession of that ball for as much of the time as possible. The problem is they can't all have it all of the time. So the focus for us in terms of skill acquisition is how do we help them to maybe run with the ball should be listed first. That's a good argument. Then how do they dribble around opponents to get by them to move the ball down the field? And ultimately, how do they keep possession of the ball by learning how to maneuver the body, also known as shielding or protecting the ball? In terms of defending player actions, probably the only thing we want them to do is actually steal the ball. So, you know, in putting that thought process in the mind that stealing the ball, stealing is acceptable in soccer if you are trying to steal the ball off somebody wearing a different colored shirt for a six-year-old, might be a really good idea to put inside the heads. And then just teaching them the way of poking or blocking or actually taking the ball as it's on its way to somebody else, intercepting it. So how does that differ then? from the developmental goals of eight and unders. Well, for players six, seven, and eight, moving out of the six and unders into the seven and eights, what we've done is we've coupled them with a partner or just having them understand what it's like to play within a, a group of two, even though we've got them in teams of four. Chances of them playing with all four people simultaneously are remote, but not impossible. So the skills there added on to shoot and dribble would be to pass and receive. So partner activities would be tremendous for this age group. Uh, and then just teaching them the variations on passing and receiving the soccer ball for attack and for defending. Stealing the ball again is at the forefront. And now we're probably going to get into a little bit more of the working together as a group but I'm not going to introduce pressure cover and balance just yet. I'll pause there for any questions that we may have. So, Rob, do we have anybody asking anything at this point? No questions in the chat box at the moment. Outstanding. I cannot believe that this is that clear and there are no disagreements so far. Oh, good for us. All right, so as we age up, what player actions are needed for this age group in the seven versus seven? So we're now aged up to the nine and ten year olds. So what would you add in for attacking player actions and what would you add in for defending player actions? I'll give you 
15 seconds on this one. You shouldn't need all too long. Going to add too many player actions, I would hope, as we age out up into the 7 versus 7 age group. Are we getting participation, Rob? That's the key. Yeah, lots of people in the chat box. Uh, adding on, Wills just added passing and receiving, finding being in a passing lane. Um, okay, good. Good. Any others? Zidro, finding open players. Tom Scott, find openings. Lou Mignon, creating passing options, switching play, getting compact and staying compact. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you guys all a heads up. I'll just take you back, so bear with me. So again, I'm thinking about skill acquisition. I'm basing it on the six techniques. So your your answers should be in line with those of the six techniques and the player actions therein. So when we move to the seven versus seven, understanding that the developmental goals, not necessarily the need yet, it depends what you've got in front of you as always, but the developmental goal is now trying to get them to play as a team. So we've taken from this environment where they're willing to work with a partner, maybe an, two partners to get them in groups of three, and now we've put them on a field and got, we're going to ask them to play with six other people in a seven versus seven environment. So you're playing with six against seven. There's a lot of people on the field at this point. So the player actions, you're absolutely right, would be to shoot. And questions that they should be asking themselves is, if I've got the ball at my feet, what do, what do I do? Well, the, the answer should be, if you can shoot, do it. And if you can't, get it to someone who can. What does that mean? Well, if we jump down past dribble and go to pass, move the ball forward to a teammate if possible. And if that's not possible, keep the ball within your team if it's not possible to move the ball forward. Of course, to be able to pass the ball forward, we also need to have teammates who are able to receive the ball and understand how to keep that ball for themselves or to be able to prepare it to move it on to share it with another teammate. Failing those options, we might double back and go up the screen to dribble and think about creating a shot for themselves. That's always option number one is how do I get the ball close enough to goal that I can take a shot either for myself or maybe I can draw some defenders out if we've got some savvy players on the team and move the ball forward or onward so a teammate has an opportunity to shoot. Defensively, again, steal the ball. And now we're looking at pressure, cover and balance related to the angle, speed and distance of approach. And we invoke the player action of pressure cover and balance to help us make it compact and keep it compact getting the group closer to our goal and behind the ball so the opponent now has an obstacle to deal with so that's what we have based on the player development framework for seven versus seven rob any questions no questions Outstanding. All right. It's your time again now. Nine versus nine. What would you add in? Any questions? Any chat, Rob? No, some different ideas. Mavis uh, Danso of the previous one talked about passing yep. over longer ranges and receiving with various Definitely. Steps. Yep. Uh, shooting from different angles. Uh, for Does she have a question angle. about that? Uh, no question in the chat box, but if she wants to, I can, he or she wants to. Yeah, I go on. Open. Oh, open it up for Mavis. Let's see if she's got a question. Go. Mavis, welcome. Do you have a, you have a you. question about your passing? Yeah, you're welcome. No, 
No, not yet. Thank you. Oh, come on, Mavis. Don't be shy. <laughs> no, not yet. I'm sure I will have one. I hope so. Otherwise, my whole morning's going to be shot. All right. Uh, Mavis doesn't have a... Go on, then. A few more. So, Will using support when passing. Uh, yeah. Karen Kelsey changing the point of attack. Garrow player positioning. Tony Mourinho uh, receiving aerial or bouncing balls. One, two touch passing ability. Uh, Rick's mm -hmm. not receiving with different surfaces, being able to pass and shoot from different uh, distances. Seems to be a common yep. theme is the shooting from different angles and distances. Yeah, and hopefully if the technology will hold up, oh, we've got some video that we're going to show you in a little while here. That's why I'm trying to get through these uh, plain formats so we can get to some video and maybe even have a bit more discussion about that. All right, so with, with that said, the, let's look first. We always want to start with what are the developmental goals for the age group of players playing nine versus nine. It is playing a role and position in the team. So it's really looking at the impact of how the attack, how the attacking player actions come into play in terms of your role and position of the team. So for shooting, I've put down take a chance or create a chance. Obviously, you can read all, all this for yourself. Dribbling, I've got some ideas now. A little bit more group thought needs to be taken place about getting behind the defensive line, drawing defenders in. That's a little bit more advanced thinking for you know the skill that would be required there. Uh, and I'm thinking in terms of keeping the ball closer, but just a little bit far further away from your body to tempt the defender to thinking that they can get the ball. And then once that defender commits to it, that's how you draw them in, by the way. Once the defender commits to it and then regaining, not that you've ever lost possession, but then manipulating the ball to move around the defender because you've drawn them in or simply just trying to get behind the defensive line. So getting your head up, having a look how the defense is organized, and how do we get behind that line by dribbling. Uh, and then along with of what Mavis was saying, to change the pace and rhythm. So going through, over, or around the defense now should be a thought process that we're trying to instill amongst these young players in playing, for, in playing your role for the, and position for the team. What is your position asking you to do? So if you're an outside player, a winger, outside midfielder, outside back, depending on the formation and the system that you've chose, what are you going to ask those players to do when they're in possession of the ball? How are they going to go through a defence? How are they going to go over? How are they going to get around a defence? Uh, and then receiving, of course, it's always about preparing for the next action. Is it a small touch because you have pressure coming immediately or are you afforded the availability of a big touch so you can move the ball forward more quickly? Any questions, Rob? Comments? No questions or comments. Oh, it's not much of a conversation when you're only talking to your screen, is it? Maybe we'll have to turn this coaching something else, coaching dissertations. All right, in terms of defending player actions, stealing the ball, pressure cover balance. Now it's together with the teammate or with the team. And then how do we make it compact and keep it compact within that team, uh, within the units of the team maybe, and within combined units of the team? Attacking a midfielders behind them or midfielders and defenders behind them. So just trying to figure out what those actions are and how this information gets layered in. Let's close out this uh, player actions piece for the MV11. We'll give you another 20 seconds to input your remarks here and then we'll get into some video and we'll see where we go with that. Anything, Rob? Uh, so, Garrow's got a question. What's a good way to keep your defense compact? So, the, so 
It's a really good question. Uh, one of the ideas that I think is important for them to understand is, is that it is, it's about being together. That one of the ideas that I've used, and it's not always about what I've done because it doesn't always work, let me assure you of that. But one idea I have tried and I've seen work quite effectively is you, you, you ask the player, okay, which player are you responsible for? And so they'll immediately point to somebody different. If I'm, I'm thinking about you've got your back four and the three or four players in front of them, they all point to somebody. So that's who you're responsible for. So then it's trying to instill the idea of you're responsible for the immediate player that you've just spoken to, half of the player to the left of you, half of the player to the right of you. And the idea there is that you're trying to get them to work together with the player to the left and right of them to help them defend against that player if and when they get possession of the ball. So this idea of closing openings but working together to keep the openings closed is really quite important. But it's that idea of I'm here to assist the person next to me. I'm not just going to stand back and say, hey, that's your player. You're, that's your responsibility. I've now been informed that that's partly my responsibility, so I need to do what I can do to help, with the caveat being that when my guy gets the ball, you make sure that you're helping me too. Again, a bit of a long answer, but I found it quite effective. Did he like the answer? Did he not like the answer? He says, thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. For 11v11, 11 11, uh, he's saying taking chances yes. on offense 1v1 to create options. Uh, Lawrence planning Unbelievable. third man running. Rick Miana, all six skills performed quicker and under pressure of time, space, and opponents. Uh, I'll add he to sounds that. like heading, an educated guy. Heading yep. to, uh, to score, to pass, and to clear. Well, look at that. It's almost like they've read my presentation. So heading appears on both sides here. You know, we'll focus on heading because we haven't touched on it at all uh, for the for, for player actions, and it's potentially it's really not in there at the grassroots level. But uh, it, heading is important, and heading is important for attacking as an attacking player action and as a defending player action. So I've included it here. Uh, again, this presentation we, we are going to make them available. Rob's going to create a web page where we're going to put all of our webinar sessions up, both in video format and in just in the slide presentation themselves. So you'll have access to that. So uh, if there's no other questions, I am now going to get into uh, some video, if that's OK with everybody. How are we doing on time? We're all right. We have a question from Hussein. How do you deal with a player who was encouraged to get rid of the ball instead of possessing? Uh, so I think that's a conversation with the player, isn't it? Uh, and so now, now we're really starting to go into the skill acquisition piece. Generally, when you think about the way that you've coached, have you focused? And it's a question you need to ask yourself. If if you if you want to put an answer in the chat room, please go ahead. Feel free to do that. But I want you to think about your method of coaching, the way that you've done things. Have you tended to focus on? and at the ball uh, and the reason i say that is this if you've focused on the player with the ball or the player closest to the ball only now with questions like this this is an opportunity to engage the player away from the ball and ask them questions like so if the ball came to you right now what would you do what do you think might happen to that player as you ask that question? I'm sure the first thing would be, why the heck are you talking to me? Because the ball's nowhere near me, coach. But think about it. You ask the player away from the ball. Okay, if the ball came to you right now, what would you do? You could ask a defensive question. If a player came at you right now, do you think you're in a good position to prevent them going to goal. Are you in a good position to protect our goal right now 
if there was a player coming towards you with the ball. So trying to create a, a cadre of questions that you would ask the players not on the ball, not around the ball, but away from the ball, to try to get them to think more about game understanding. Because the, the number one key quality of a player is to read and understand the game. But if our focus has always been at the ball, are we really reading and understanding the game ourselves? And again, I'm, I'm throwing this out there. I'm sure some of it will stick. Hopefully some of this will resonate with you. I said that hopefully word again. I'm sure it will. Uh, and if you want to ask any questions, if you want to throw up an argument against it, for me, that's what generates good dialogue and conversation. So please feel free to go ahead. Don't be afraid. There are no stupid questions. There are just really funny ones. Nothing? Get anything, Rob? No questions in the chat box, although you seem to be typing in Spanish. I do? <laughs> yeah. If we're trying to score goals, how can we do that if we do not have the ball? From Rick Miana. If, if, your, if your objective for the game is score more goals and yet your team can't get possession of the, of the ball, uh, my first thought might be you've picked the wrong objective. My second thought be, might be, oops, you've come up against a team that's got a little bit more than your team has today. My third thought would be, what can we do to challenge the players to flip the field? And unfortunately, that might be a wait till half time situation and say, OK, who's had the ball the most, them or us? What can we do to change that? It might be in the form of a challenge. How many shots have we managed to take this this half? And you need to have those statistics to hand, by the way. So that's part of your data collection as a coach. Uh, and, you know, whatever that answer turns out to be, maybe it's geared towards why have we not had any shots and let them come up with the solution of, well, we really haven't had the ball. OK, what can we do to get the, get more possession of the ball? So it's, it's just working around the problem to find the solution through the players. It's the best I've got with the time you gave me. He, uh, he added that the question was related to the kid that keeps booting the ball away. It's about confidence. Oh, really? Ah. Uh, so with that, that player who keeps booting the ball away, uh, you know, again, I would go back to the, the answer I, I was given to Hussein. It's like, okay, okay what, what is the moment that tells you you need to get rid of the ball quickly? And what is the moment that tells you hey, I can keep this ball for a little bit longer. Just having them think in those kind of terms initially, because it's got to be a step-by-step -step process. And obviously, depending on the rapport that you've created with that child, it appears to be there's either a fear factor with them of being in possession of the ball, which you need to get get help get them past, or they've listened to those people on the sidelines, also known as parents, I am one of them. I I don't really ever want to say anything negative to that group of people because if I can't get them to buy in, I'm in the wrong place and I'm in the wrong service. So, you know, it's don't listen to the people on the outsides. Think about the things that we've done in practice. I know they want you to kick it far up the field. I know they think that's how the game is played. But think about what we've worked on in practice. And think uh, about keeping possession of the ball. Great question from Tony Marino that we're going to um, just hold on to, to a little later in the presentation. Because uh, it oh, could take God. a while That's... to answer. Uh, but I am going to oh, open really? up the mic for Heidi to answer a question. It's related to the timing of the coaching interaction. Okay. Heidi, you there? Go ahead, Heidi. Hi. Um, so during this discussion should be happening during the run of play and or in a free situation. Mm hmm. Yes. Because you could use it uh, as a coaching I'm... moment for the whole team in the freeze moment and as well as just 
encouragement to a player standing outside back, you know, just a side conversation with them, correct? Okay, so I'm going to give you a full transparency answer, which isn't normal for me. So in my formative days as a coach, I used to I used to coach with a whistle. I know it's it's almost unheard of. And what I used to do, Heidi, was when I blew the whistle, I used to cold call on players and say, okay, if the ball came to you right now, what would you do with it? If the ball came to you right now, point to different players in different positions. And what it did was, what I found, and maybe it wasn't the best coaching methodology, but the cold call in effect was it kept players on the toes because they were like, oh, I better have an answer for him if and when he comes to me next. So, yeah, I mean, using it in a freeze, but you need to give them a heads up that, hey, this is the format that I'm going to use here. I'm going to use this cold call in format. So you need to be thinking about an answer ahead of time is probably the better way to execute that that I've just spoken about with the blow the whistle, then, you know, cold call on a player and say, OK, if it came to you now. You need to prepare them for that. I would say that was something that I didn't do very well. In fact, I didn't do it at all. Shame on me in my formative years on a coach and as a coach. And I would say it's one of the areas that I've grown in. So, yes, in answer to your question, yes, in a freeze moment, you could ask that player, ask that question of multiple players just to figure out what their game awareness is and are they reading and understanding it in the right way. Absolutely. Yeah, certainly in the run of play to, to one individual, but if you take a freeze, you could ask several individuals, uh, and it's just a different methodology that you've used to get your point across. Did I answer your question? You did. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. Thank you, and wash your hands. Uh, all right, I'm just going to break away from this presentation for a second. I am now going to go into a video for us all to watch. Uh, we tried this. Um, can you all see a video on the screen? Just give me a wave if you can. Yes, thank you. All right, so you got you, you're, we're at a video here now. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to forewarn you. This is a team from either Thailand or South Korea, but it's certainly an Asian team that have come over to, or not come over, but went over to England. They're at the fabulous facility where the England national team train. This is from our coaching education partners at the coaching manual. So that's why this video looks quite clear. What, what I'm going to do is, first off, this may not work as well as anticipated. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the video or try to stop the video and just, just put some thoughts inside your head. And then let's see if we can have a discussion about what we've just observed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the next six seconds of the video. And right off the bat, as this player up here with the ball passes across to the center back and then watch what this. I want you to focus specifically on the next player to receive the ball after this. And tell me what you observe, if anything, based on the quality of the video. Then we'll replay it and we'll stop it at different times. So just let's just watch this for about five seconds, see what we can come up with. So this player. Okay. Because I'm so gracious. I'm going to let you watch it again. All right, so now what I want you to do is I want you to think about the three moments involved here. I want you to think about what is the player about to receive the ball what is that player, first and foremost, what's going on inside the head? What are they thinking about before the ball is released? What are the clues that you have that tell you, potentially, doesn't, it may not be as accurate as we think, but that tell you potentially what this player was thinking about before the ball was delivered to him, and then follow on with that. So it's the 
pre-action of what, what we're going to do. It's the inaction of, okay, now I've got it, what should I do with it? And it's the post-action of, I'm going to do something with it, and now what do I do to finish out the skill? So let's just watch it again here. Uh, and maybe the video isn't clear. You know, you'll have to let us know in the chat room so we can maybe find a different format for this. So what's the first thing that that player did? Did you notice it? The, we, could open, we can open up a mic. If, or just raise your hand or just give us a, a nod in the chat room and let us, let's hear some opinions of what you've just seen. So Will in the chat room, uh, they turn the, oh, turn their body to shield the ball as the pressure came. Uh, checking shoulders. Uh, Garo looked over shoulder. Rick, where's my first yep. opponent? What's next? Okay, that's good. Uh, that's good. So so we're on a good path. You could go ahead. Yeah, Lou, Rob. Lou, uh, looking for teammates. Surface selection. Mavis, okay. So, from. Right. So let's hold there. So this is good. So th the pre-action was as the ball's on its way, I'm scanning the field to make my observations to help with my next decision. And it's all of the above, isn't it? It's checking the shoulder to see where my teammates are. It's checking my shoulder to see where the opponent is. By checking my shoulder to see where my teammates are, that will help me to prepare the ball onto its next movement or its next action. By checking the or scanning the horizon to see where the opponent is will tell me how much time I've got to do that. All of that is taking place in split seconds. The ball's on its way. Now watch what happens. What happened? So it's time to write into the chat. What did you see happen there? What we're getting, Rob? Anything? Yeah. Uh, Lawrence, he prepared his body. Lumignon redirected. Yep. Will control and prepared to pass. Mavis, he directed his touch away from the defender. Rick, after the analysis, a decision was made. Hussein, proper receiving first touch. Uh, guess number yep. six, let the ball go across his body. Uh, no mention of where he's looking with his eyes at the moment. Okay. Open body, All right. pressure coming in front of him. So play sideways from Chris. Okay, so in this one action, in this one one action, you've you've watched it twice in in full real time. Hopefully the video was clear enough and it it went smooth enough for you. It was about four four five seconds at the most. In this one action of the ball on its way, the ball arriving, and now the ball about to be delivered. What did you notice about this player? So again, make some notes in there for us. And if, if you want to open up your mic and give it a shout, we'll, we'll, we'll try that. It may not work because maybe too many people all at once. Are we getting anything, Rob? Yeah, uh, uh, as he passes the ball or after the pass, he faces the opening, goes to a support position, immediately drops to provide support, makes himself available for a return pass. Yep. All right, brilliant. Because as we do, I'm just going to let the video roll for a second here. Oh, well, we don't actually see it because we get another glimpse of the coach. So in that short sequence there... All of that's all of that is taking place before the ball arrives. As the ball arrives at the player's feet, the things that have taken place with the player, and then after the, after the delivery, and one of the things that nobody mentioned—I won't say you missed it—but nobody mentioned it 
was the follow through and pace on the pass by the centre back out to the left back or out to the left sided centre back. I'm not sure which one it was right off the top of my head. All of that makes this a skill. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think about younger players. For those of you that coach 8, 9, 10, 11, and maybe even some 12-year-olds, and some of you may be saying, well, my 13-year-olds would do that too. Bear with me a second. All right, how many of your players would stay in that position to receive the ball and receive the ball facing the player who just passed it to them? So that's part of the skill acquisition, isn't it? It's it's the ability to get your head up, to scan the horizon, to make decisions based on your observations, and then adjust both your body, adjust to the ball, and then manipulate your body and the ball at the same time to execute the desired action. So this is just this is more than a simple case of receiving and passing. So this and this is the beauty of of skill acquisition within a small a play practice play activity is how would you coach this centre back specifically to open up the body when receiving a pass from the from the flank from the outside of the field from the wing to the centre of the field to play out to the other side. How do you devise a practice that focuses on just this player, but includes several other players? Because when we look at this whole thing in total here, there are three players involved. One, two, three, and we're out. So again, real time, in a game-like situation, you've got attack versus defense. In actual fact, you've got a game to two goals in this particular part of the training session here that we're looking at. And yet you've got all of that, all of those components that comprise the acquisition of the skill for receiving and passing. All right, now let's look at this piece. And if you've got any comments uh, that you'd like to share with us, please feel free to do so. Uh, we're going to watch this little segment here of a player who does a stop turn. All right, this player with the ball, stop turn. And we'll rewind that. Uh, let's see if we can get... So, again, this player with the ball, what's this player doing as the ball is on his way, on its way? Why was the decision made to pull the ball back? And instead of instead of going towards goal, ended up playing back away from goal. So give us some thoughts as to why you think the player stopped in the first place. Or firstly, let's build pre-action. What did the player do to help them make the decision of pulling the ball back? Sorry about this. I'm messing about with your heads here. What was the what was the pre decision? What was the inaction decision? What was the post decision? And the post action. That's better. So Ian, just uh, right. this ties into a question that Mavis had a little earlier. Um, so we want yep. to teach the players who are not necessarily on the ball or involved, but away from the ball especially for the U9 to 10 group, um, mm -hmm. how would you do that? Are we talking about this specific clip? Uh, this was a question from earlier on, but it ties into your, uh, your comments about how would we create activities or environments where we would be able to bring out those player actions. Okay, so it, uh, on the screen, do you see this player with the ball? Rob, can you see this play with the ball? 
You see this player? What's this player doing? What's this player doing? Printing. Okay, what's this player doing? Moving, Moving forward, forward, yeah? Yeah, right. Not as fast as this guy. Yeah? Now look at the red players. What are they all doing? Headed back towards their own goal. Could we argue that? Okay, so just by this visual here, you've got a moment where it's an attacking moment and a defending moment. The red team are trying to defend, prevent the, the, the blue team from moving the ball forward. The blue team are most assuredly trying to move the ball forward. What I specifically want you to look at here is the actions of this player and this player who, who may end up with the ball, actually. It could be that player and ends up with it back, but maybe this player. In, in what they are trying to do for the player that receives the ball up here. Let's just watch that. Oh, we don't see it. Oh, you. All right, so potentially then we've got the sprinter ends up receiving the ball. We've got the player who made the pass following up behind and the guy on the inside. Now look at the numbers that we've got of the blue. One, two, three, four, five, six versus in the picture. One, two, three, four, five. So we're starting to create this idea of as the ball moves forward, everybody else moves forward too. That's called helping. You can put all the soccer terminology you want into there, supporting the attack, creating passing options, triangulation. You can put all of that in there, but it's base level. It's a recognition by the players in blue that, hey, we've been successful at moving the ball forward. It's now our job to go and help. So that would be my starting point in answer to Mavis's question. What I would suggest is you tell these guys, make the pass forward, but then stand still. How does that feel? What do you feel like you want to go and do for your players? Uh, again, it's this, it's this idea of creating a conversation with your players about what they think would be the necessary best action to execute as opposed to I'm going to tell them to do everything by telling everybody to get up the field. Let's see if we can have the players figure it out for themselves. Did I answer the question? On it. Go ahead. Some comments and uh, questions from the, uh, the chat box. Um, so Tony's yeah. mentioned it may be a lack of space because the end line is at the top of the box. Um, there's been... Mm -hmm. Other comments regarding lack of support or the angle of support. Can some blue players um, drive diagonally into space, as suggested by Chris? Um, yeah. And also the 1v1. Uh, does the player recognize it's a 1v1? Uh, Hussein likes the 1v1 situation. Okay, so as, as we freeze the video here, now we're looking at this field from the back, which is moments after. I haven't moved the video on all too much. We're still a little less than a minute and a half in. You know, we've had two opportunities. We've looked at some skill acquisition. The first one, the, the second one by this player, the decision not to play the ball in behind and to turn back and play the ball backwards. And now we can maybe see an idea of why. This defense is pretty organized. So the skill required not just to cross the ball in because you can get the ball behind the back line, in, into this space here but the idea of there's nobody from my team who's going to get on the end of it you know we could we argue that maybe he wasn't risky enough and he didn't go for the one-on-one -on -one to encourage the other guys to go to goal faster of course we could of course we could i would put the caveat in here is the the objective of this session is actually building out from this goal by the blue team so maybe that's not such a coaching focus for this particular um, training session. So it's just something to bear in mind. But the, the fact the fact of the idea is, as the ball was on its way, the player looked up, realized there was nobody to play the ball into first time, decided 
his best option, his decision, his best option was to turn back and maybe play back into a safer situation where they had more numbers. That's part of skill acquisition, the recognition of the when moment. When do I play the ball forward? When do I keep it within my team and maybe find a different slash better option? Uh, really good uh, question, Chris Uppington. If it's a yeah. U10, do we encourage that 1v1 situation? But a U13, recycle the ball. I think on a selfish level, the answer to, to Chris is yes. You do encourage the 1v1 because, you know, I'm sure you've worked on ball manipulation and dribbling to beat an opponent. So you want that player to get behind. The follow-up to that would be then making sure, again, this is you're coaching the player on the ball again. Okay, so, you know, I want you to be courageous there and do the one, take the 1v1 with the defender. Immediately, though, you should be, and maybe even before he does that, as the ball's on its way, you should be saying to these guys here, hey, what kind of runs should we be making now the ball's gone out wide in the two a 1v1? So forget about this guy. Again, you can be selfish and just deal with this guy if that's your focus. But let's get these guys involved because these guys aren't thinking about staying involved with this guy. Because if they were, he maybe would have been encouraged to take him on one-on-one -on -one anyway. So just something for you to bear in mind. Can we coach more of the players off the ball to impact what's happening to the player on the ball? And how do we make that happen? Uh, okay, I'm just going to go to one more moment here. Um, and it's a defending one, actually. So the coach has asked them now. You can see there by his actions. He says, hey, once we've lost the ball blue, what should we do? He's trying to get them to press up. So watch what happens here. Goalkeeper plays the ball out. What did you see? I'll play it again. Okay, what did you see? Defensively, from the initial one. What are we getting, Rob? Anything? We are. Uh, maybe it's a blue player pressured the ball, a risky pass from Karen Kelser. Goalkeeper telegraphed his initial pass. Um, the blue player showed him the inside and pressed. Immediate pressure. Yeah. Blue is yeah. aggressive on the initial pass. Um, okay, that's that's great. But what, what we what we want to do is we want to talk just in terms of this player. So it's the recognition admittedly the ball may have been a telegraph pass it's the recognition that the ball is going to arrive at this player so that's step one recognize that step two then is how quickly does my or how does my speed of approach match the pace of the pass in order to do what either get this player's head down to just focus solely on the ball and or through my angle and distance to get them to play backwards to the goalkeeper, all based on this player's decision making for the skill acquisition piece of pressure in the ball. So pressuring at the right moment to the right player at the right speed, at the right angle with the right distance. And maybe right's not the best word, maybe correct would be a better word. So just thinking about that, I mean, when you when you hear your comments and you listen to your comments, are they really related to this player? Better yet, how can we get these players to encourage this player to get there in time, to keep this player's head down, to force the pass backwards? So just things for you to think about in the skill acquisition piece. Oh, I'm over. I'm going over time here. We're at 11 o'clock. 
so what I'm going to do is I am going to get out of this video piece. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm sure you enjoyed that because coaches, we love that kind of thing. I'm going to go back into my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, move Rob out of the way. Okay, and I'm going to end it with this. Uh, if, I'll stay online for a, four or five more minutes. If you've got any questions, comments, criticisms, witticisms, or any feedback in general, I'd be happy to take on board and we can have a conversation offline or online, but offline from the webinar. Uh, and again, just a reminder, uh, for Massachusetts Youth Soccer, we are going to be hosting these webinars every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., every Thursday at 10 a.m. And I thank you all again for your time and your efforts this morning and your patience for sticking with us. And then on Fridays at 3 p.m., we will host our third and final one of the week. And we'll be doing that for the next few weeks and the foreseeable future while we are in this containment period. So thanks again. Be safe out there, take care of yourselves, take care of your families, and make sure to wash your hands. The recording will end now. Thank you. So Ian, we're gonna jump uh, to Tony Marino. Tony, I'm gonna...